So today I'm going to talk about trustworthy machine learning in complex environments. I'll start by saying that we live in an era of information deluge. Uh, even the smartest of us can find ourselves overwhelmed by the highly dynamic and vast data streams you have to keep up with in order to make informed decisions. You know, for example, whether it's driving our daily life of driving at a busy traffic junction, or it is healthcare and medicine decision that concerns our high priority needs, or even in a very extreme case, let's say command and control uh, in a modern multi-domain battle space, right? So there is an urgent need to develop machine learning models that can augment intelligence for trustworthy interactive decision-making. And in order to make machine learning trustworthy, I'm gonna talk about three very important desirables, um, robustness, efficiency, and ethics today. And specifically, I'll focus more on the robustness. So we know that there are some obstacles in terms of achieving robustness you know, for our final goal of trustworthy machine learning. To start with, in my vision, I think for real intelligence, you probably inevitably have to interact with the environment to, you know, to influence the environment to finally get a feedback and do a long-term uh, interactive decision-making. So this inevitably has to involve some kind of RL agent. By RL agent here, I do not necessarily mean like an RL algorithm, but I just mean like the problem formulation is in the RL setting. So if trained from scratch, often you have to go through the suboptimal exploration and many of us are aware that this may take too long and even you know more dangerously will expose the agent to danger and even if you've spent a lot of time training an agent for example this agent needs to stand up you've spent like a week training it to finally stand up but all of a sudden when you observe some kind of out of distribution observation it will fail again Right? So this is really challenging in order to achieve efficiency. But then the question I wanted to ask today is, do we really need to learn everything from scratch? Right? So as most of the existing work, we are learning everything from scratch, but do we really need to do that? Right? So this example of, you know, for example, you have trained a patrol robot uh, with infrared sensors, um, you know, during the daytime. So it's been really successful doing very good things. But let's say if you have a sensor upgrade, do you still want to train everything from scratch, right? Even if it is in the same field and the same daytime, but it's just a camera, up, uh, you know, sensor upgrade to cameras, right? What if you rather than wanted to patrol uh, during the daytime, but during the nighttime, right? Are you still gonna train everything from scratch? The existing methods inevitably have to do that, have to train everything scratch, from scratch. But we say that it is often desirable if you are able to efficiently adapt to these unseen inputs or tasks using whatever you've learned before through some kind of knowledge transfer, right? So look at this very, um, popular learning paradigm of sometimes you have simulators that you can generate a lot of data to train very good strategies in the simulator. But this is, however, whatever strategy you learn finally have to deploy it in the real world, right? So this is often called the problem of sim to real. In such situation, you inevitably have to suffer from distribution shift because the real world is unstable in nature, right? So then what are you going to do? Or can you still efficiently adapt to these unseen input? Now, when these, you know, perturbations or, you know, distribution more severe, that you kind of have to go through this kind of adversarial perturbation. We know that a well-trained agent could make wrong decisions under adversarial attacks. And this has been very well studied in the supervised learning setting. But what if you have such feedback, right? And especially such vulnerability is really uh, dangerous, especially if you have high stakes tasks like autonomous driving or medical um, you know, decisions when you make, 
can you trust these decisions, right? Uh, so the desirable ability here is you really hope that we can behave very robustly under these adversarial inputs. Now, finally, I wanted to raise everyone's attention to ethics in machine learning, because in my vision, computer, it, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning should be in service of human. And when human is in the loop, you wanna make sure that the models are conforming to social norms. If the models are not conforming to social norms, you will probably not trust the model to make the right decision, right? And oftentimes, you know, the, uh, existing models do not necessarily consider ethics as the first priority when they design their model. So I wanted to ask the question is, can you make sure that your model is performing well, but also conforming to social norms? So this is um, my group's recent work. I guess, you know, our recent progress over the last three years, we made some progress for each of the three aspects. I'll talk about mostly focusing on the robustness. I'll talk about efficiency and ethics. I'll probably also talk about uh, the bridging between robustness and efficiency and bridging between robustness and ethics, um, but we'll see. Um, let's start with robustness. So as I said, when RL agents are training, uh, you know, when are training RL agents, they often learn from scratch in a new state. Right? So, but if you think about human, this is not how we do. Right, so when, um, when human make a decision, when humans see something new, we often do not try to learn from scratch. We often look at the history and try to find some similarities between what you see now and what you see in the history. And using that similarity, you hope you have some common senses that you can transfer so that you can speed up your learning for this new concept. So, but unfortunately, RL agents do not necessarily do that. So I wanted to ask this question, can we learn by analogy, just like what humans are do? Using this philosophy, we actually propose that we can try to speed up the RL agents by the philosophy of learning by analogy through many different levels of learning. For example, learning in a single task. You often have like this explored and unexplored states and existing methods, especially this, you know, exploration, curiosity-driven methods, often encourage you to go to the unexplored states, to explore as much as possible. But of course, these unexplored states might very well be very dangerous sometimes, right? So what we are trying to advertise here is rather than directly, you know, go to the unexplored states, can you gently, you know, get a taste of them and probably try to find a similarity between what you've already learned in explore states and do some kind of knowledge transfer so that you can transfer whatever you've already learned in your MDP, uh, you know, in terms of the explore states to this unexplore states. So basically the idea is, you know, learning from um, knowns to unknowns. So you kind of transfer knowledge from known to unknown and you learn these unknowns from the things that you've already known. So this big actually can theoretically reduce computational complexity and sample complexity of model-based algorithms drastically. Um, this is not, this doesn't have to be happening in a single task learning. More, import more importantly, it can you know, be existing in ex uh, multiple tasks. For example, if you've learned some tasks in some simpler environments with smaller um, input observation space, probably you can transfer this knowledge to a much harder task with larger observation space. And similarly, you will be able to transfer knowledge. The idea here is rather than transferring the underlying MDP model, you probably should separate things out to find some modular similarities. For example, a flag can be transferred to another environment if it is the same flag, right? Puddle transfers to puddle. And based on this modular similarities, you're also able to transfer knowledge or common sense, even if the tasks have completely varying state spaces and action spaces. This is really cool because this basically allows the first pack MDB algorithm for varying state action spaces 
transfer learning without inter-task mapping. So I won't go too into the details, but these two works are basically our recent progress in terms of understanding theoretically how you can speed up learning when you are in a tabular setting where you have you know, finite state space and action space, then you can come up with a guaranteed improvement. But what I wanted to talk about today is the more uh, you know, state of the art neural network driven uh, reinforcement learning agents or decision makers, where you often have very large state space like image or video as your input. And under that situation, you basically cannot be in the tabular uh, scenario anymore. How are we going to also transfer knowledge is what we're gonna discuss today. So this is the recent work we call it transfer across observation spaces with latent dynamic similarity. I'll motivate using this toy example here. So oftentimes the observation space on the RO environment usually changes. You can imagine this example here that I have a maze and I have my agent being, you know, here, I have a target there, you know, I may have a, a source task, which is much simple, whose input is just my location and the location of the goal. So, you know, it's just a vector representation, which is very compact and turns out to be a very simple RL problem that you need to solve. But you could also imagine, rather than having this very compact and informative representation as my input, I may only have like a top-down view image of the entire maze. And that becomes a much more challenging problem because my observation space is much larger now compared with the former compact vector representation. So, but one thing you observe is that we live on the same planet. And the basic laws of physics is the same. So you could imagine if it is the same maze, I should have a very similar latent dynamics model, which is characterizing, you know, taking whatever action, whatever state I should transit to. But this, of course, you know, is not gonna be the same because you have observation space being different. But what if you can find a latent space that so that you can have the shared dynamics? But it's like finding a needle in a haystack. How do you find it? That's the question. You can imagine in practice, this happens a lot. If Petro robot with infrared sensors upgraded to cameras, of course, this seems to be naive, but you could imagine maybe later on when you have high technology, cameras will be upgraded to, I don't know, 3D cameras or something. If that happens, how are you going to do learning? Are you going to learn from scratch or can you just transfer knowledge to these more advanced sensors? You know, as I said in practice, you know, the observation space changes. One needs to retrain an oral agent from scratch, which is inefficient, especially in this large environments. Our philosophy here is to do knowledge transfer. Similarly, um, you know, we wanted to be able to transfer whatever we've learned from a very simple task, which is easy to learn. Hopefully this knowledge will help us learn these harder tasks. Sometimes these harder tasks might even be invisible to learn. And we're hoping that through this knowledge transfer, we're able to learn that. Actually, I'll show you some examples later on. But let's see how we do it. Based on the fact that the underlying dynamics have not changed, we wanted to propose the following solution. We basically want to regularize representation learning by transfer to dynamics model. And this is really cool. You'll see how we do it. In source, in source tar, uh, task, we have a state, right, ST. In this case, it's just this very compact, informative vector observation, right? Where is me and where is my target? And that state will go through an encoder, whatever neural network it is. And finally, it will give you a representation in the latent space, ZT. This representation will go through a decision maker, such as a policy network or something. And finally, we'll give you a policy that maximizes the reward or the return, right? Which is what normal RL algorithms will do. So this paradigm seems to be nice and seems to be you know, utilized by a lot of existing methods or variants of it or whatever, but we find a problem. We find that a good representation should actually approximate multiple policy values Whereas this paradigm only cares about your uh, underlying policy, which is just one policy. 
this seems to be a big problem. Then you wanted to argue, how can I find a good representation such that this representation is going to be um, good enough to approximate many different policies? The answer is you actually would resort to a model prediction. Using the theorem we find, we realize that there is a sufficient condition which ignores uh, the requirements that your representation should be good for all the underlying policy. But rather, it tried to say that if I'm able to do a model prediction very well on this uh, learned representation, then it's guaranteed to be a good representation in theory, which is really nice. Then you are able to use an auxiliary task so that your representation is going through a extra task of fitting the dynamics model in the latent space. And if you're able to make sure that the dynamics model have very high performance, then this is guaranteed to be a good representation. And with that, this will help us in terms of the target task because we say that the dynamic, dynamics model is gonna be transferable among the tasks because you have a shared latent dynamics. And therefore, during target task, you are gonna fix this dynamics model, making it fixed, but then you will go through using that dynamics model to regulate this representation learning before your decision maker. This is really nice so that you achieve like the best, uh, the first algorithm that is able to transfer from a source task to a target task, even if the observations is completely different. Here are some empirical results result on half cheetah environment. You started the source task with 17 dimension, which is a very compact representation. Itself is a very simple RL task, right? Because your observation space is very small. But now we artificially add some noise to make the dimension to be 145. But even more extreme, you can change this vector observation to a pixel representation of the half cheetah and that becomes your target task. And it turns out our method is significantly better than all the baselines and even approaching this green line, which is the easier source task learning curve, which is like an oracle, you shouldn't ever be better than that because it's just a simpler uh, source task. So is that, this is the first algorithm to achieve vector and pixel knowledge transfer without any predefined mappings. So now um, after this you know, knowledge transfer, maybe this uh, agent is able to infer, oh, you know, because I like strawberry donut and mint cookie, I probably would also like mint donut. So I'm gonna take this mint donut, but wait, there's a bug on it. Right, so now here comes the very natural question that the agent's observation space has been perturbed, which is as if like there is an attacker or cyber attack that is attacking the observation space of the agent, which one is very familiar with. And I'll actually talk about two of your recent work um, um, very soon. So um, as the old saying goes, if you know yourself and your enemy, you will never, you will never lose a battle. When your observation space is under attack, you may face a lot of catastrophic failures. We don't want it to risk that, especially when there is a high risk, kind of a high stake task. If it's autonomous driving, someone put a, a sticker on the uh, traffic sign, then your autonomous driving system will completely fail. This is not acceptable. Want to make sure that is, you know, robust. So if you know your enemy and yourself, you will never lose a battle. I'll first started to think about how to know my enemy, right? So I wanted to understand and measure the vulnerability of reinforcement learning algorithms by studying the attacks. And then once we know the enemy, we would know how to improve the robustness of an RL algorithms by looking at these vulnerabilities and try to find solutions to them. So the goal is to find the strongest attacker efficiently for any policy. And this is why we call it test time vulnerability as well as evasion RL. So there is a, a 
policy that is deployed during the test time and want to find the strongest attacker for that victim policy. So the policy is fixed. Existing wor uh, works are very difficult to achieve both optimality and efficiency. Why? Uh, both of them are important because optimality tells you the worst case situation, like the worst attacker, um, what the worst attacker can do. Whereas the efficiency means like, even if you're able to find the worst attacker, if you're not efficient, you probably simply cannot find it. It's just invisible. So we wanted to be able to achieve optimality and efficiency together, which is very important to understand the real vulnerability of these RL agents. Uh, many of the heuristic based methods are myopic. You know, they basically directly utilize what people developed for adversarial machine learning and supervised learning and directly, you know, apply them to this setting. But RO is intrinsically long term, right? Whatever you do is going to affect future. So you should always be cautious about your future. You always should have a long vision. These heuristic based methods are myopic and do not have a long vision. So they are not really revealing the vulnerability, the worst, of, uh, the strongest vulnerabilities here. So we can actually theoretically prove that, you know, many, many of these heuristic based methods are not optimal. Uh, a recent work, um, you know, by uh, Huan et al, uh, Zhang et al, <laughs> uh, proved that optimal attack is an RL problem, right? So based on that theory, they naturally um, propose an end-to-end -end RL method that directly learn a policy that maps states to perturb states. So this is a very natural idea, but you know it has it sometimes may be sample and computationally expensive, especially if your state space is very large, let's say an image space, then it will become very difficult problem because RO is already very expensive. Now, if you are mapping states to perturb states, makes it, makes it even more expensive. So that's why it motivates our work here. So we're thinking now you have states under attack, right? This is nice. You know, you, you have a state basically under the attack, the state will be, become another state H of S. But we all also realize that if you have a victim pie, under this perturbed state, your victim pie would, you know, just give you a perturbed action. Now, with that realized, you basically see that adversarial attacks are just perturbations of policy. In some sense, you're saying that whatever you perturb to my state, what really affects me is that my actions being perturbed. If my actions not being perturbed, However you perturb my state, it doesn't matter to me. So that's the most important observation here that the adversary attacks are just perturbations of the policy. Now, if you wanted to find the strongest state attacker, it is equivalent as to find the strongest policy attacker that takes down my value to the maximum degree. As I said, the previous end-to-end -end attacker is very nice in terms of optimality, but you know, it inevitably have to suffer from this large RL problem to control the perturbation of the state because you know, oftentimes we care about very large state space. Now, with this observation, we're able to decouple this very large RL problem to a smaller RL problem and a non-RL problem, which essentially this non-RL problem is just a supervised learning problem. And it turns out this RL problem is much smaller if you have a smaller state spa action space than the state space. So uh, theoretically, we also guarantee that the strongest policy attacker, which is this RL problem on, on this end, is much easier to identify. Uh, than the previous end-to-end -end RL. So with that observation, we propose the so-called policy adversarial actor critic method, which is not only optimal in a sense that it, got the, it finds the strongest attacker, but it's also efficient because you, know, you are dealing with action perturbation rather than the state perturbation. 
previous method, for example, heuristic attacker, just to remind you, they were efficient but not optimal, whereas the previous optimal um, method is optimal, but it could be inefficient, especially in the large state space. So let's see some empirical results. So you can see that this significantly outperformed the state-of-the-art attack performance on a wide range of environments. Especially this is tested on Atari games. You know, this is uh, important because the Atari game is image states. So it's very large state space, but they have relatively smaller action spaces. And this works very well. We can see that using very small amount of epsilon radius, you get the lowest possible reward for these games. This is really concerning though. It basically reveals the vulnerability of RO agents that even this small amount of perturbation, maybe you can really not tell that it gave you the lowest possible reward, right? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I, I, I think it's a heuristic based attack, but I'm not quite sure I could uh, get back. Yeah. Yeah. Not like a long-term vision. Yeah. yeah. And I'm also seeing the limitation of that kind of attack about that was, uh, for me, for and it's uh, amazing. You can make a zero reward. Yeah. Because of taking that advantage of the RO algorithm, solving the RO algorithm rather than just the short myopic attack. Yeah. Yeah, so, so after, I would like to show you a demo here. This is an Atari gate pump and the agent is the right green paddle. You can see under the previous best attacker, the reward is bad, but it's still trying, the agent is still trying and moving. But if you look at our attacker, actually what you observe is the perturbed state. So you can see for human, it's like, why would you fail, right? Because it's even imperceptible. But you can see under our attacker, the reward is you know, the lowest possible. And it's basically kind of stuck there, which is very concerning because RO agents are very vulnerable. Now with that vulnerable, um, revealed or, you know, like uh, we understand the vulnerability now, can we defend ourselves, right? Can we evaluate and improve the robustness of an RL algorithm through defenses? So the existing defense work are mostly two works. One, the first work is also Hans' work in 2020 is enforcing the consistent output under similar inputs. This is really natural and it's also a really nice defense. It's very fast, but the problem with it is that it is not considering the worst case value because long-term effect is not considered because we're only simply enforcing the consistent output, which is not like a long-term uh, output. So then, you know, they proposed an alternative, which is alternatively train the agent and the attacker. This is much stronger in the sense that it considered the worst case attacker, you know, which is solving an RL problem. But this is also very slow because, you know, we know it's going to be solving like an RL problem in every step of solving an RL problem. So it's like doubling the sample which is very concerning uh, because we know RL is already sample hungry. If it is you know, doubling the required samples, then it's probably gonna be invisible for us to learn something in a very large state space. So with that observed, we really hope that we're able to achieve the best of the both worlds. So we'll propose a method, hopefully it will estimate and improve the worst case value together with the clean value without rendering or requiring any additional samples. And I hope that the advantage is that it's considering the worst case, but not require extra samples. This is our goal. And in order to achieve that, we propose this worst case Feldman operator. This worst case Feldman operator is, looks very similar, like a normal Bellman operator um, is actually proven to be a contraction operator whose fixed point is just worst case Q value of a policy under some attack budget. But what's different here is this 
long-term vision. It basically says that rather than looking at my next step of the state and action, rather I have to look at the set of the actions that the policy may select under attack for every future step. If I have that long-term vision, then this worst case bombing operator is gonna be very cautious about the worst possible attacker that is, you know, ever I, I could ever encounter. So with that, this is like achieving both optimality and efficiency in terms of designing a defense. Let's see some result. I think this work has a really impressive empirical result here. If you look at a different variety of attacking strengths, starting from very you know, mild attacker to much stronger attacker. You can see our method, which is the Volcar PPO thing, is much better compared with the state of the art, uh, the previous state of the art. So you are getting like a SOTA robustness. What's even more impressive, if you look at the Pareto frontier, you know, which is the trade-off between the natural reward and the worst case reward is also the outermost which is kind of very nice in the sense that, you know, not only you achieve SOTA robustness, but you also achieve the best trade-off. Uh, not only that, this is also, you know, achieved using a very short amount of time. The efficiency is also the best compared with the previous state of the art because you don't require extra sample for it. So this seems to be a really like strong empirical result that we're seeing in terms of this worst case Feynman operator. But also I would like to show you some interpretable results. This is the defense we see in the first row. This is, you know, state of the art defense is like a P-A-A-T-L-A PPO. So it's like alternatively train an attacker and use that attacker as like an adversary example and to make sure that your uh, defense is robust to that adversary example. Whereas in our case, we train like a worst case Bellman operator. And what's funny is like under all these different attackers, you know, the previous state of the art is like somehow jumping with one leg, although this is a walker agent. <laughs> you know, when you are under attack, you know, naturally you wanted to lower down your body so that you're more stable. And that's exactly what our attack, uh, what our defense learned to do. Whereas somehow this previous defense is probably overfitted to a specific attacker because they have to generate these attackers, right? And I think that's why they ended up jumping with one leg. All right, so now I wanted to talk about something that we probably really have to experience as in our everyday life. I think everyone in the world can be thought of as an agent with a uh, limited sensor range. You kind of observe your uh, neighborhood, your own little world. But if you really want to make informed decisions, you know, your limited sensor range or your limited information you have, your partial observability is going to limit you in terms of decision making. That's why these days we all solicit that information. We can Google, we can ask your friends, we can hire a lawyer, we can ask mechanic Turks, we can solicit all the information from the world and we call it communications. You get all the communication messages from everyone in the world or as many agents or as many of your friends as possible in the world so that this will alleviate your partial observability. Maybe it will help you make informed decisions. For example, this agent has this very limited sensor range but they wanted to try to understand whether I should go up or go right to get the gold. And if you have friends telling you, hey, look up, there are hundred bucks, but here there is a bomb. So you probably should just go up rather than go right, right? This makes perfect sense. Basically communication alleviates partial observability. But the real world is not always so benign, right? What if there is misinformation? Where's the, what if there is information conflict? What if, you know, there is like a malicious agent or, you know, one of your friends suddenly become an enemy or you are under cyber attack. Then in this case, this agent says, rather than there is a bomb, you have a thousand bucks here. Then of course you'll make a decision of going to right 
which is going to cause catastrophic failure. So your decision made by soliciting information from all the agents, from all the communications, may be mislead by these adversarial messages, even if this is probably just one of the adversarial message out of the many adversarial uh, out of the many messages you receive. So what I'm trying to say here is that communication can carry misinformation or adversarial attacks, and communication can be a double-edged sword here can help you, but can also hurt you. So we hope rather than having such kind of vulnerable policy to adversarial perturbations, can we have robust policy that can basically be robust to these perturbations? And the basic philosophy we take here is to trust consensus rather than a, a individual. So it's gonna, we are gonna propose like a certified defense based on this trusting on consensus. Here is how it works. So you have many messages re you receive from the world. Uh, rather than looking at all of them, you're going to do some kind of ablation. You're gonna find a subset of them to form this many different ablated K message samples. Each of these sample have K messages rather than the M minus one messages. And in this case, with this K message samples, you can train a base policy. This, this base policy, rather than taking all the N minus one messages to make decision, they only take K messages to make a decision. We call it base policy. But in training, we're assuming that everything is benign. You know, in practice, maybe you can train these things in a simulator so that you, know, you can make sure that you're not under cyber attack. But during test time, you cannot control the world, you deploy your algorithm, you deploy your policy. Many of these um, you know, messages may be corrupted. Under the situation, you still form these ablated K message samples, but out of this K minus one, choose K different samples, some of them are gonna be benign, but some of them are gonna be contaminated. But nonetheless, you're going to go through this previously learned the base policy during training time to get a base action, but you're going to do that for all of these ablated samples because you don't know which ones are benign, which ones are contaminated. But overall, you're gonna make decisions based on this ensemble of base actions and the agents will take a majority vote of all the resulting K minus one truth K number of actions. Finally, this is acting on consensus. This very simple idea of ensemble seems to work very well in practice. In theory, it says that as long as you have more friends than enemy in the system, so that your enemy is like not outweighing your friends, and as long as you have purely, uh, purely benign K message samples greater than contaminated K message samples, uh, as long as you have benign samples that can reach some kind of consensus, not like everyone is disagreeing with, even if they're benign, uh, they are disagreeing with uh, each other, then that's gonna be a very hard problem. But these two things can be achieved, these two conditions can be achieved by smartly selecting this hyperparameter, uh, which I'm gonna not talk about the details, but finally, if you're able to achieve this condition, then you can get an action certificate. Basically your selected action is guaranteed to be safe. It actually matches the benign consensus and this reward is also guaranteed um, to be lower bounded by this natural performance. Um, so basically this means that an ensemble policy under any attack is gonna perform similarly as the base policy under no attack, which is a very, uh, I think a very nice result. So empirically, you can see this kind of food collector environment is the multi-agent environment we design. So, you know, you have this agents with the sensor range, limited sensor range, and they have different color. They can eat the food of their own color, uh, but they cannot eat this black dots because those are poisons. Uh, and they also cannot eat food of other color. They can only eat food of their own color. So in this situation, you can see um, our, uh, pro our approach or our defense 
actually can gain information from the benign communication. This is what reward you would get if you don't communicate at all, this dash line here. So then you can see if you are communicating, your reward is much higher than you're not communicating. So you're still getting information if you have benign communication under no attack. But when you are under attack, you can see our algorithm can significantly improve the robustness under these attacks. So it's robust against adversarial communications. Uh, what's even more is like under this k equals to two, this is results under k equals to two, you can only theoretically certify two attackers. But in practice, what's even amazing is like, even when the number of attackers greater than whatever you can certify, for example, c equals to three is more than k equals to two, but you are still getting like pretty robust results empirically. So your theoretical guarantee is in some sense, a little bit pessimistic. All right, so for this part, I talked about robustness of adaptation to the unseen input, basically is to do knowledge transfer, uh, transfer at all levels of learning. And we also talk about the robustness under uh, adversarial input, we want to evaluate and defend vulnerabilities even for multi-agent systems. So now I'll very, very quickly go through some of our recent work on efficiency, um, because I think you know, it is a very important topic, but is not the focus of today's talk. So we know that uh, you know, convolutional neural network is a very important kind of uh, uh, backbone in a lot of applications, especially in computer vision. And what we realized is that you know, inspired from kind of tensor form and tensor representation theory, if you uh, extend this linear operations in this convolutional neural networks to multilinear, then it can naturally achieve model compression, which is really nice because when you have model compression, you can have guaranteed generalization error. So this theorem is showing that when you have the same number of parameter, you are guaranteed to have higher expressive power using this multilinear operations, which is really nice. And as a result, you even get an improved generalization. I'm not going into the details, but this will definitely help us in terms of personalized machine learning or federated learning in constrained devices, especially let's say your smartphones, you cannot really simply have such large models. How are you going to make sure that you're still able to do federated learning on your smartphone. Actually, one thing I'm thinking is like, with this framework, maybe it is even more robust to adversarial perturbations, which is something we haven't tried, but something I'm really curious about. So some results, uh, you know, a very uh, challenging long-term video prediction result, uh, a task on this, you know, tensor uh, informed the neural network actually achieve the best performance with the fewest parameters, which is very impressive. Uh, and here for image classification task on CIFAR 10, uh, you know, original performance is 93.2% using 460K parameters, but using only 10%, you still achieve a 91%, which is very close to the original performance. Uh, and not only that, this tensor-inspired uh, neural network can also be used for making transformers more efficient. And indeed, we use a rigorous visual representation, we call it tensor diagram, to understand the role of the hats in a multi-hat self-attention unit. And turns out people's common sense that multi-hat self-attention is just a paralyzation of the single head self-attention is wrong. Indeed, the multi health self-attention by concatenating things is actually doing something quite important for achieving this high expressive power in transformers. It turns out we can use some kind of tensor representation theory in together with tensor diagram, we can prove some guaranteed higher expressive power by designing a new uh, class of transformers. Actually, this newly designed transformer become a plug and play module. It can be replacing the existing multi-head self-attention in the existing transformer models. So it's a very convenient 
tool that can be directly plugged into the existing models. Uh, and finally, uh, I wanted to say that we have some recent work understanding, uh, you know, theoretically understand the model invariances and data augmentation. The idea is that people realize a lot of the existing success of the machine learning is dependent on the data augmentation or more precisely data transformation, like rotation, uh, you know, cropping uh, or random arc and these kind of augmentations. Uh, but it is not clear why these augmentations help you in terms of learning. So we wanted to understand why, and we kind of study the generalization benefit of model invariances induced by these kind of transformation. So we kind of introduce a new concept called a sample cover, which uh, prove the generalization benefit of this data augmentation. Uh, also, we have some recent work on scalable uh, graph neural networks. I won't go into the details, but the idea is we're able to scale up very large scale graphs on graph neural networks using some kind of very simple ideas such as vector quantization or sketching, uh, which is like, a, you know, a, a, you know, low dimensional, low, low rank kind of approximation method. Um, finally, uh, I wanted to say that there might not only be some kind of, uh, you know, you, you, our understanding of the robustness of um, machine learning or trustworthiness of the machine learning system should not only focus on one aspect, for example, one aspect of robustness, one aspect of efficiency, but maybe you should look at both of them together, right? So this work, uh, which is the recent work we did, is kind of looking at the robustness and the efficiency together and the idea is that through model design or architecture design, you achieve model robustness for free. This is really interesting because you're getting like a certified robustness for free, just using the design of an orthogonal neural network. Um, and it, indeed this achieves the performance, the efficiency improvement together. Um, and, and finally, as I promised, I wanted to talk about ethics. I think ethics is so important, but one thing I realized uh, uh, in existing methods, when people talk about fairness, they often consider the training and the, the test data are the same. Very seldom they would consider the you know, practical situation that the training and the test is always have a distribution shift. This is what happens in the real world. If you train a fair model in hospital A, this model is not going to be fair in hospital B. Indeed, it can be very not fair. <laughs> um, so we look at both robustness and ethics and wanted to understand how to transfer fairness um, even under a distribution shift. So kind of take inspiration from self-supervised learning. You know, we know that in self-supervised learning, what people do is kind of uh, they propose a theory um, oh, sorry, they propose an assumption to explain the success of the self-supervised learning. The assumption is an assumption about the underlying population distribution. They're saying the mass of the correctly pseudo-labeled area is gonna be greater than the mass of the incorrectly pseudo-labeled area. And this is a pretty a reasonable assumption as justified in the paper. So with that assumption, they were saying, if you have consistent prediction, that's why self-supervised learning using consistency loss. If you have consistent prediction under transformation of the same input, such as cropping or rotation of input, then you can propagate label from source to target. And base, this basically means that if you have model invariance to nuisance factors, then you can transfer accuracy from source to target. Now, with that, we wanted to use this inspiration to see how we can transfer fairness under distribution shift. And indeed, we propose a slightly different assumption. And actually, this assumption is much milder than the previous assumption because we only require the expansion with in-group. By with in-group, I mean you are looking at the same gender you know, which is the class, you're looking at the same class and you are looking at the same sensitive attribute. In this case, it's race. So by looking at the same gender and same race, 
as long as you have this expansion assumption, which means that again, within the group, the mass of the correctly pseudo-labeled area is greater than the mass of the incorrectly pseudo-labeled area, then you are able to guarantee if you have a consistent prediction under transformation of the same input under, uh, for, similarly across the groups, then you're able to propagate label also similarly across the group. Similarly across the group means this is gonna be fair. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't matter. It could be extended to many different measures, but here mostly uh, group fairness, for example, many kinds of group fairness. Yeah, but not individual fairness, you're right. Uh, so th what this means is that a fair model invariance to nuisance factor will guarantee that you have fairness transfers from source to target. So this is really nice. It's as if like you are making sure that your fairness is not to some nuisance factor, but to the thing that really matters. If you have the fairness to things that really matters, then even if you're under distribution shift, you should be fine. So lastly, I think existing fairness work only consider one time point and do not consider the long-term decision-making. And in my opinion, I think, you know, decision-making has to be interactive, has to be long-term because we're not live in one time. We live in, you know, a continuous time, uh, you know? So we, we need to make sure that the decision-making is fair and not only for classification, maybe for something more general, such as resource allocation and so on. So with that, I just wanted to conclude that I've talked about um, different aspects, uh, kind of a wish list of trustworthy machine learning under this interactive decision-making, especially under complex environments. And I've talked about each of them as well as you know, pairs of them. My long-term goal or you know, my ultimate goal is to be able to look at all of them together, maybe have a robust and efficient as well as ethical system. Uh, and then I wanted to uh, attribute all the credits to my students. They're awesome. Without them, none of these can be possible. And I want to thank my um, sponsors as well. Thank you, guys. <laughs>